Dr. Porter, welcome to the Nailed It Ortho Podcast. So happy to have you on as a guest. Um, so welcome. Thank you. Thank you for having me. And to those listening, we also have to give a, a big welcome to Dr. Thomas Hodo, who's actually one of my co-residents, who will be making his uh, his guest appearance on this podcast. So Hodo, thank you for joining as well. Thank you for having me. Oh, yeah. And um, Dr. Porter, kind of what we do is we just start off asking just a couple questions in general, getting to know you. You know, we're going to talk about oncology today. We're going to talk about staging and grading. Um, but, we, you know, I know you you do a lot of things outside of um, outside of work, too. And so one of the first questions I had for you is, you know, I know you you have a scrub business. Uh, can you talk a little bit more about that? But what what um, what kind of got you into entrepreneurship and orthopedics? Because, you know, that's. It's not two things that you always hear going hand in hand. And, and can you tell us a little bit more about the business that you that you started and that you have? Absolutely. It's it's actually a love of three things. It's a love of medicine slash orthopedics, a love of um, philanthropy, and then a love of um, starting business and the whole entrepreneurial thing. And so uh, it's interesting when I started medical school, um, back in the day, and, and I was the first in my family to finish college and all of those wonderful things. And so I had a vision of medicine uh, that perhaps was a little bit Pollyannish, but nevertheless, it was my vision. And when I entered medical school in 93, um, we had this desire, or I had this desire of taking care of patients. And then fast forward to when I finished training and research and everything else in 2005, I'm sitting in a boardroom at my first job and um, it's a physician meeting and the administrators are talking about uh, customers. And I remember thinking something happened in the last 12 years where patients turned into customers mm. and I didn't quite understand it. And so um, I took a couple of uh, business classes just uh, on the side through the American Orthopedic Association and uh, a light went off. And so um, myself and a, a buddy of mine decided to, to go to business school. So we ended up going to Kellogg. Um, we got our uh, MBA from Kellogg and that really solidified my entrepreneurial spirit, if you will. And so at the same time, I started a charity for my cancer patients. I do orthopedic oncology and I started a charity for my cancer patients so that they um, could have some reprieve from life's daily uh, bills. And we would just literally raise money and then give money to patients to pay their bills. And we were very blessed and we raised about a quarter of a million dollars or so doing that. Oh, wow. Yeah. Yeah, and I figured, you know, maybe I had something here with some of these crazy ideas I have. And so I got burned out uh, doing that in cancer. Oftentimes the check you write is is uh, the last check you'll ever write and the patient passes away. And so I was getting burned out and I figured why not try to create a business with that same philanthropy in mind. And so I'm very blessed by my day job as your listeners uh, either are or will be, as the two of you will be, um, will be very blessed. And uh, a buddy of mine always says that um, in orthopedics, you'll have um, all of your needs covered and the majority of your wants too. And so for me, I wanted to start something then that could be sustaining self-sustaining and still fun philanthropy. So we started Just Cause Scrubs, uh, which essentially sells uh, the same scrubs, white coats, uh, outerwear that um, any uniform shop all over the country sells. The same uniform shops you have in New Orleans, the same ones we have in Greenville, South Carolina. A uniform is a uniform. We all get them from the same uh, manufacturers, Cherokee, Gray's Anatomy, um, Dickies, et cetera, et cetera. We all get them from the same manufacturer. The difference with us though, is we have a 50-50 profit share with charity. So you buy from us, uh, same cost, same everything, uh, identical scrubs and white coats. Um, and then we will share 50% of the net profits with the charity of your choice from among a list of charities that we have. 
That's and awesome. We have national charities that are in uh, are in uh, the game with us. We're very blessed to have them, and uh, it's it's truly just a blast. It's fun, and it's all made possible by the fact that we're blessed in our day jobs. And I've got buddies of mine that are in this with me. And all of us are just having a blast with the philanthropy part. And if we can disrupt a little bit in the market and um, have fun getting charities money, well, man, that's the, that's the Holy grail for yeah. entrepreneurial. No, that, I mean, kudos to you and, you know, you guys for setting that up and, and continuing to do that. That is, um, you know, that's something big that, that, you know, if you're going to get scrubs anyways, why not, you know, donate to charity. It's um, exactly that's right. Out, right. You're going to get them anyway, same price, same scrubs. Um, but you're going to feel a whole lot better when you put on scrubs, knowing that you've not donated to, or you've, you've generated the donation to JDRF or Michael J. Fox or Shriners hospitals or, uh, National Breast Cancer Foundation. I mean, there is National Pediatric Cancer Foundation. Um, there are uh, there are a lot. Yeah, no, it's great, and it's always a, a good why behind the story. And I love you know the story that you have behind this is how you know you originally started up for your for your cancer patients, you know, helping them with their bills because that's very stressful and can and can you know play another part in even in how patients do overall and having that as another stressor. So. Again, you know, nothing but the utmost respect. And, you know, I, I think that's awesome that you guys have started that up and uh, and are keeping that going. So everybody listening to this, I hope you, the next scrubs you got, you, you get, you go get some Just Cause scrubs and, um, you know, and, and help support the cause and help support these charities. Absolutely. And if anyone has any questions uh, about that or any of this, um, my email is easy. It's just scott at justcausescrubs.com very simple. Excellent. And I think uh, Dr. Hodo had some, had some questions, some burning questions he wanted to, he wanted to uh, run by you. Shoot. Yeah, Dr. Porter, um, I know it's not, orthopedic oncology is not the one of the most common specialties that orthopedic um, doctors go into, but just wondering what, what got you started into interest with uh, orthopedic oncology and how, what made yeah. you want to continue on and pursue that? So it's interesting. Um, when I uh, was in medical school, again, I didn't have the whole family mentor kind of a thing or, or close friends. So I was really flying by the seat of my pants. Um, my parents instilled upon me things that are much more valuable to me than medical school. So, so I took those things and I tried to figure out what I would like uh, to do in medicine and in medical school. And um, I was a, a blank canvas, but much like many students, what drew me to orthopedics as a whole was the camaraderie, the, the fun, the appearance of the people that were, were in the specialty at the time. Um, and I went to medical school at Yale, and so this was um, in the mid-90s, and a couple of those residents that were residents then, rather, um, attendings now, I still know, and every now and again will run into, and, and they left an indelible mark on me, so I, I, I knew I wanted to do orthopedics. I was a bit of, a, of a, uh, an athletic kind of a guy and, and uh, kind of fit the mold. But then when I got into orthopedics, I realized that I didn't like many of the things that we were doing. And it wasn't that I didn't find value in all of those things, but I remember sitting around um, on a Halix Valgus lecture, and, and I will never forget this. <laughs> and I remember thinking that my, my, my dad worked two shifts at the factory uh, growing up and, 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 and sacrificed in order to send me to, to, to college and then, um, did all of the sacrifice to get to medical school. And I am sitting here trying to figure out a toe at 14 degrees or versus 11 degrees. And I thought that this was not, not for me. And so um, I was um, truly thinking about switching to trauma critical care, uh, just because as an intern, you get enamored with how uh, those individuals come into the trauma bay and, and, it's almost as if they're they're riding in on Pegasus and and all things happen and I was enamored by that again very influenced by by the appearance of the individuals 
And so um, fortunately, um, once I got out of the lab, my very first rotation was a uh, tumor. Mm -hmm. And my mentor now, um, then attending uh, Dr. Jeff Nieso in Charlotte, it, there was something about the way in which he conducted his, his practice, his life, the way in which he cared for patients. It spoke to me and it, it, it was a way that I could impact uh, perhaps greatly the lives, not lifestyle, but true lives of, of patients. And uh, there was one in particular that um, was post-op day two or three when I started on service. Little, uh, she was a, um, a high school, uh, early high schooler that had uh, distal femur resection and reconstruction. And for some reason for the next, and this was, a, I was a second year. So for, for the next two years, I would see her randomly in the hospital. And anyone's ever been to Charlotte, it's a massive hospital. And I would mm -hmm. just run into her coming from radio or coming from chemo or coming from her scans or this, that, and the other. And she would stop me. She would remember me. She would stop and she would show me pictures, pictures of her, of her uh, homecoming, pictures of prom, pictures of this. Uh, she ended up getting married and, and it was, it, 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 it touched me greatly. And I, I um, will never forget her. I will never forget Dr. Nisho, but, but that is what, what got me into it. I could, be a part of uh, people's lives um, more than just um, tangentially or more than just uh, episodically. No, that's I great. I completely attest to that. That's one of the reasons why I'm interested in it too. Um, the, the lifelong uh, relationship you create with them and also the multi-specialty type of uh, ordeal you create it's just with histology and almost internal medicine and the a lot of the almost the trying to figure out what the disease is, so all of that kind of speaks to me, and I kind of agree. Yeah, it's a lot. Like, you know, it's a lot of uh, coordination uh, among multiple services, just like you said. Um, also, just to kind of ask a little bit, maybe one more question about uh, orthopedic oncology. Uh, mm -hmm. What is the process like? Uh, I would assume this is a little bit different since there's not as many fellowships with, you know, post-residency training and also the job market and how it is, you know, working as an orthopedic oncologist at your point? So I don't know about the fellowship process anymore. Um, you have to realize I, I applied to orthopedic oncology fellowship in 2002. So um, I don't know um, as much as, um, I should. I'm very blessed to have had um, five residents so far go into tumor. Um, and in my 16 years, I think that that's uh, one of the things that I, I treasure most. And so, um, so I would submit that there are people that are going to be much more knowledgeable about the match and all of those things. Uh, when I applied, it was still the time of you go in an interview and if they like you within 24 hours, they'd give you a call. And that was, that was the whole process. So the I applied to one days. fellowship. Oh yeah. I applied to one fellowship. <laughs> I got a call within 24 hours and um, it was one of those, Hey, yeah, you know, um, uh, you got a day and we're going to move on to the next person. It was one of those kind of deals. And mm. so, uh, so I don't know the process um, as well as I should. That being stated, the job market is a very interesting one. I don't think that there are very many jobs left that are purely tumor jobs. Um, what does that mean? So that means a job where you don't supplement your practice, your income with anything like joints or sports or trauma or spine, et cetera, et cetera. You are just tumor. And um, there are a number of reasons why that's the case, but um, those jobs are, are, are few and far between. And there are uh, the people that enjoy those jobs, I don't think are, are as much either. Um, and that's a whole billing and reimbursement and all of those kinds of things. And the manner in which uh, uh, tumor surgeons are reimbursed for the RVUs. And that's a different conversation that, that we can talk about later. But the point though, is that many of us supplement our, 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 um, our lives with something else. Um, and so 
the way I look at it is you've got tumor people that have done a fellowship and do very little tumor. You've got tumor people that have done a fellowship and do split tumor versus something else. And you've got tumor people that have done a fellowship and don't do anything but tumor except for the occasional trauma call. The first two jobs are easier to find than the third job. And that's probably the easiest way for me to say it. And if a listener has a tumor person at their, at their, at their disposal, they can ask, I, I would run it by that. That's what I would submit is, is, is where we are right now. There are a lot of tumor fellowships, a lot more than when I did it. And each one of those uh, fellowships puts out um, a tumor surgeon. Yet the population of, of the country isn't growing as rapidly as the population of tumor surgeons. Therefore, there's a lot less work going around for each individual tumor surgeon. So if that makes sense. Yeah, no, that makes perfect sense. And that's what I've, um, that's what I've heard. And even with Hodo and I, whenever we've spoken about, um, you know, you know, oncology and, and practice, and I know we've always, always mentioned that, um, you know, you probably supplemented with doing like a joint practice or something else. Exactly. Uh, I think that's um, definitely a good thing to have in mind. Um, all right. I think that was great. And I think we can go ahead and transition to our topic of the day, which is just kind of just some basic info on staging and grading in orthopedic oncology. So we just had just, just say, for example, Dr. Porter, you referred somebody. It's a 15 year old female. She's referred to your clinic to the thigh pain. They found a lit, like a mixed uh, lesion on MRI and you, you're given x-rays which show, you know, some, some obvious, you know, mixed osteoblastic lesions, some, some evidence of, 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 um, of malignancy. Now, I know the point of our talk today is to talk about staging and grading. And Hodo, I don't, I don't know if you were confused, but for a long time, I was confused on what the difference between staging and grading is. Sure. So Dr. Porter, can you kind of just, just go and just, just give us a little bit of detail what the difference between staging and grading is, and then we can kind of go into how you stage and what's important. So, so yeah, there's, there's um, a lot of, I think, confusion about the two, about the two words. And, and I would submit to you that there's a lot of confusion about ortho-oncology um, until you have to study for your boards and then you forget it all and you got <laughs> practice. And so, yeah. so, and I, and I totally recognize that it, it, it's only important when it's sitting in front of you or you've missed something and you're getting sued. Right. And let's just be honest, like that's, that's when it's important. Yeah. And so, so the way I look at it is trying to figure out a way to make it interesting for uh, the general orthopod and, and Hoda, you heard the lecture at the Louisiana orthopedic, um, uh, society meeting and, and it's it's these things can really be breaking broken down quite quite nicely for people to remember and so the way that I look at it is is grading and staging so grading is is a way in which we can tell how aggressive a tumor is okay the way that I think about grading is that um, grading is like a speedometer in theory, there should be an infinite number of grades between zero and 120 miles an hour, just as there are an infinite number of speeds between zero and 120 miles an hour. It just makes sense. Um, a tumor may grow at, um, uh, I don't know, one mitosis per 20 cells, or a tumor might grow at two per 20 cells, or three per 20 cells, and each of those mitoses could happen at Q two weeks or Q four weeks or Q six weeks. Mathematically, therefore, there is an infinite number of speeds with which a tumor grows. Does that make sense? Yep, makes sense. So, so, so if you think about it like that, and if you also throw into the mix that tumors grow and grow is in air quotes, because what happens is one cell becomes two, two becomes four, four becomes eight, eight becomes 16, et cetera, et cetera. Each one of those cells, however, is the same size. So the tumors grow, but it's a misnomer. What happens is the tumors become more cellular. They okay. grow in cell number. The speed at which that happens is the grade. Here is the thing that for... 20 years, I've never been able to understand. How can we make an infinite number of possibilities into two? 
you've got two choices. Sometimes, depending upon what system you're using, they will throw in a um, intermediate grade. But generally speaking, generally speaking, it's low grade versus high grade. So an infinite number of, 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 of possibilities is broken down into low grade versus high grade. So this is the first thing you've got to keep in mind when you're trying to stage someone because the staging system is based upon the grade. The staging system is based upon the grade, right? Right. So, so this is one of the reasons why I can't stand telling patients what grade they are. The extremes, you know, I took out a, a, a seven centimeter sarcoma from a kid's foot uh, last week. There's zero mitoses on that slide. That is a low grade tumor. If you, if you sent that to a thousand path out, it's a low grade tumor. Um, I have a, um, a guy that we're about to do a proximal humerus on that had a Ewing sarcoma that was, um, um, uh, Ewing sarcoma. It's, it's high grade. You give that to a thousand, it's high grade. So those we know, the ones we don't know is at what point is low grade actually high grade and vice versa. So, so grade is a horrible way. <laughs> the signal to somebody that a tumor is either growing slow or fast. It is as horrible as you watching a car go by and saying to somebody else, is that car going fast or slow? If it's going 120 miles an hour when it goes by, you know. If it's going 10 miles an hour when it goes by, you know. But what if it's going 50? So, so, so keep in mind that grade is 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 absolutely um not living up to what it should tell us and this is the this is the the frailty of medicine so we take an infinite number of things and make it either high or low so that's number one staging is another thing that i as a tumor person dislike immensely because patients hear it and all of a sudden they think that it means something for them the way that I've always thought about staging, and keep in mind that everything I say is the world according to me. People can disagree, and that is totally fine. This is the way that I have, in my mind, put it all together so that I can talk to patients and it's worked for the last 16, 17 years. So staging, if there was a way to do some Star Trek type stuff and strain you, take all 30 trillion cells that make up the human body, and count individually, how many cancer cells do you have out of that 30 trillion? That would really be your stage. And you'd be able to go to someone and say, you've got 10% cancer cells and we could do research. If you've got 10%, how many of them live? How many die? If you've got 10.5%, if you've got 11%, that would be real staging but that ain't what we got. What we have are hundreds of thousands of people around the world that have cancer. Let's just talk about sarcomas. What we have are tens of thousands of people around the world that have a sarcoma. And you mean to tell me that tens of thousands of people can be captured by a four level system. It makes absolutely no sense again to me because what you should have is a percentage and then that percentage of total cells would yield something, that's not what we have. What we therefore have to do is to develop a system that lets physicians talk to one another and lets physicians do research so that they compare to the best of our ability to compare. So what does that mean? So staging is a way to give a passerby another physician, to give someone an idea of how heavily involved a patient is with their tumor. Okay. So grade is kind of like a continuum, you know, of, of uh, you kind of look at it as a, as a continuum and, and lower grade per se, cells aren't um, dividing as quickly or they have not grown as exactly. much versus a high grade. This is just like you said, increased cellularity because these cells are, um, are dividing very quickly. So you'll see um, things that indicate that this is um, 
they may have more mitotic activities or just markers that there's a lot of um, dividing and in, dividing and growth going. Yeah, but I would caution you and say very is not a word that I would use because I don't uh, know what very means. Okay. You just have dividing. And so the very is all based on whatever someone, whatever the person reading it says that it is. And so what is high grade? If you've got five mitoses per high powered field, you've got a high grade lesion. And so think about that. You've got five mitoses out of X number of, of hundreds of cells. So you've got less than a percent of the cells that are dividing and that's high grade. Yeah. So, so do you see my point? It, so, 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 and if you think about it, the reason why that works is you should never really see a mitosis. What I tell people in down here in the South, it, 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 it works. It's like seeing a buck in daylight. You know, the bucks are out there, but you rarely ever see one. And if you do see one, something is going on. The mitosis, you know, they're out there, but the chances of you cutting through a specimen and catching a mitosis under normal circumstances is extremely low. If under cancer circumstances, high grade cancer circumstances, you're only gonna have five to 10 per high powered field, certainly under a normal situation, the chances of you finding a mitosis is very low. So low grade is actually the absence of something, whereas high grade is the presence of mitosis. Got it. And um, so we've, we've got into grading, we, we defined somewhat at least what grading and staging is. Now, yeah. what are some of the, um, now, now going into staging, what are some of the important things that we need to know about staging? That's, that is a great question. So if you, if, if you sit and just ponder what we just talked about and the frailty of the ability to truly grade and stage on a cellular level, and if you truly just get that a grade because of our, our, our inabilities is either gonna be high grade or low grade, right? It's either gonna be something that you can easily see or it's gonna be something that you can't see in terms of mitosis, high grade or low grade. And I'm totally making it simplified, but let's just go with it. High grade or low grade. The most important thing in this entire system then are two, two very important things. If you can remember these two things, you will be three quarters of the way in the staging system, all right? Okay. But first, again, staging is a, an estimate of the disease burden for the entire body. An estimate of the disease burden for the entire body. The belief being, if you can find disease distant from the site, if you can find disease distant from the original site, the assumption is you've got a lot of disease. Even if you can't see it on a CT scan, you've got a lot of disease. Why? A CT scan can't pick up a single cell. CT scan can't pick up a cluster of 10 cells. A CT scan can only pick up a cluster of cells when it gets to a size that's greater than the background noise on that scan. If it gets to that size and it's in a distant area, you can assume that you have got a body that has a lot of micro metastatic disease. If one cell figured out how to get out of that primary site, there's nothing special about that one cell. Remember, they're all derived from the same cell. If one figured it out, that cell's brothers and sisters are gonna figure it out too. It's not rocket science, right? So if you've got a, a met that is distant, you're stage four. Okay. You're stage four. Regardless of any other data, if you have a met, you're stage four. Because the assumption is, again, that population of cells is no more special than the other 100,000 million, 100 million cells that are in the primary tumor. That one cell didn't figure out something special. So if you've got a MET, chances are you've got micrometastatic disease elsewhere and you're a stage four. You've got a high disease burden. Does that make sense? Yes, sir, that makes sense. So if you keep that, the second piece, grade, 
if you've got a low grade tumor, if you think about grade again, being the speed of division, the speed of multiplication, the speed of replication. If I give a cell enough time to replicate, the chances of that cell generating an error, E-R-R-O-R, -R -R, generating an error that passes on to the progeny cells is very low. It is errors in the DNA that results in the propensity for metastatic disease. Low grade tumors, therefore, generally do not metastasize. Now, cancer doesn't read the textbook. It can do whatever it wants. So this is all generalizations. It's as general as making an infinite number of choices down to two. But the point though is low grade generally doesn't metastasize. It is metastasis that gives you the biggest disease burden. It is metastasis that kills you. That is why stage four is stage four. All of this is to say, if you've got a low grade tumor, you're a stage one. Well, Dr. Porter, what about if it's 35 centimeters? You're a stage one with a 35 centimeter tumor. What about if it's, the, it's a stage one? If it's low grade, it's a stage one. If it's high grade or anything but low grade, it is a stage two or a three or a four. Does that make sense? Yes, so the sir. first branch point is METs or no METs. If there are METs, you're a stage four. Even if it's a low grade tumor with METs, you're a stage four, i.e. giant cell tumor of bone. Even if you're a low grade with METs, you're a stage four, all right? Yes, the very next thing you want to go to is high grade versus low grade. If you're low grade, no mets, low grade, low grade, low grade, stage one. If they ask you on a test, they show you a low grade um, fibromyxosarcoma and it is um, uh, 10.5 centimeters and um, um, in the vastus intermedius. What's the, what's the uh, CT scan is clear. What's the second they say low grade. That's, that's one, it is stage one. one. Yeah. It is a one, but I don't care what else they say in that question, right? Now you can talk about A versus B and for bone, A versus B is going to be the size. And the way I remember it is in our bad handwriting, a B looks like an eight. So eight centimeters for bone, it's five centimeters for soft tissue. That's the differentiator, right? Eight for bone, five for soft tissue. And so, um, so that's where, we, so, so if it's high grade, it's either gonna be a two or a three, and if you just remember that a three is big and deep. So you've got three quarters of the staging. You've got low grade is a one, big and deep is a three, METS is a four. Anything else is gonna be a two. And that is a good way to do it before you go in on a test. And chances are you're gonna get the question right. Dr. Porter, for I'm not sure if this actually is, is as important for bone and soft tissue tumors. I know it probably is for breast cancer, but for lymph nodes, do you do those factor into your your algorithm or the treatment uh, options, whether you have lymph node metastases or lymph node involvement? That's a great question. And it's also great because what gives you lymph node metastases? This is another testable question. So before you go into your boards or the OITE, you've got to think of the things that actually metastasize to the lymph node. There are very, 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 very few. Out of the dozens and dozens and dozens of different types of sarcoma, there are only going to be a couple, right? Synovial sarc is one, epithelioid sarc, angial sarc. Um, and you put me on the spot. I can't remember the other one. It's like I'll a, a uh, mnemonic, it's like CARES. It's like clear cell, angio, one of one is in rhabdomyosarc. Rhabdo, yeah, rhabdo rhabdo -mile -sarc. yeah, rhabdomyosarc, epithelioid, and then and synovial. Synovial, right, right. So, so um, those will go to lymph nodes. But here is the thing: they still go to the lungs. Ninety percent of the time, they metastasize. So it's not an either or. It's not an either or. It's a continuum of disease. And I've not, and, and maybe, and I am certain there are some tumor people out there that have seen it quite a bit. I have not um, seen many 
lymph node metastases that have clear chests. I was going to ask, so do you normally get, you know, do you normally get chest CTs and bone scans on everybody or is it just certain patients that you'll, that you'll get these on to evaluate for METs or how, how do you, I guess, what's the algorithm good, in your head? Good question. So the algorithm is that um, METs have a pattern of spread based upon their primary. So breast is gonna spread differently than kidney. It's gonna spread differently than lung. It's gonna spread differently than osteosarc. So, so th there is a pattern of spread. The 99% of sarcomas, if they spread, they spread to the, the chest. The classic teaching therefore is CT scan of the chest. The one exception is a myxoid liposarc which has a propensity to spread to anywhere it wants to spread. The data is still out and we don't get enough of these to actually make concrete data. And so I, I bet if you ask five, 10 different sarcoma surgeons, they'll give you a different follow-up regimen. For me, if I've got a myxoid liposarcoma, I get a CT scan of the chest, abdomen, pelvis, alternating with a CT scan of the chest for their five years. The majority of the others, CT scan of the chest. Bone scans are useful primarily for osteosarcoma. Primarily for osteosarcoma. And there is a small propensity for osteosarcoma to, uh, uh, to metastasize to bone, especially for skip lesions, which are uh, metastatic deposits within the, same, uh, within the same bone as the primary. Okay. And the bone scan, you know, reasons why that would be useful in somebody with osteosarc because these bone scans are, you know, you, you, I guess how it works is you inject some, some dye and then the bone cells that are, that are overreactive or turning over a lot, those dye are, is going to be uptaken into those cells, which will light up on a bone scan. So if it's somewhere else in the body, say the lungs or, or wherever else, that may give you, you know, a clue to, you know, you, this may be an area that has some uh, disease. Well, a bone scan isn't going to show your lungs, right? So a bone I mean, scan bones, yeah, is yeah. based on <laughs> phosphate, right? So, right, yeah. So, so it, they label a substance that bone uses in their regu in its regular metabolism. And so if it's laying down more bone, calcium phosphate, it's laying down more phosphate. Therefore, the intensity of the signal will be greater. It's just a volume thing. It's completely nonspecific, completely nonspecific. If I right. kick you in your shin and I get a bone scan, your shin is gonna be hot. Wherever there's laying down of bone, you are going to get an, a positive or a hot bone scan, which is why we should use it um, uh, very sparingly. There should be an intent with it. For osteosarc, because the survival rate for metastatic disease to bone is so low, bone scans are of paramount importance because if you, and the recurrence rate is so high if you miss a lesion. So you can theoretically have a distal femur osteosarc. You don't see anything on the x-ray. The MRI didn't go all the way up to the, to the hip for whatever reason. You get a bone scan and there's a spot in the lesser troche. If you didn't see that and you went in and did a simple distal femur, it's going to recur in the lesser troke. Does that make sense? So you need a bone scan in order to quantify if there is, or determine, I guess, if there is disease in another part of the skeleton. Yeah, that makes sense. It's very important. No, that makes perfect sense. And, um, and so to, just moving on, the next thing, I know there, there are a lot of different staging organizations is there, is there one staging system that you use? Is, is one better than the other or, or yeah. you know? So the Enneking system is, um, is the intracompartmental, extracompartmental system that is of immense historic importance. Um, and um, it is uh, a system that's still used in Florida to the best of my, my, to the best of my knowledge. But um, many, many, many people now use the AJCC and it's based on tumor node metastasis t there you go t n m so tumor describes the local tumor grade right mm -hmm. and whether or not it's superficial or deep nodes define or describe 
the um, presence or absence of regional metastatic disease to nodes. And then METs, the M, defines presence or absence of METs. The N and the M are binary. Either they're there clinically or they're there radiographically or they're not. The T is the only one that you have the whole um, thing that we just talked about um, with uh, grading and, and, and uh, um, the size of the tumor. Right. And, and just saying, you know, so we're saying low grade lesions have a, you know, generally a lower risk of metastasizing than high grade lesions. Um, right. And the RT is going to be, again, our tumor burden, which has to do with the size, depth, and, and the histological grade. And, yes. a, and A and B, superficial, can you just expand on that? Is, is it deep compartment or what? Fashion. Fascia. So superficial deep, or deep to the fashion. Ah, perfect. Exactly. Yep, superficial or deep to the fashion. Again, the compartment is the Enneking system. So don't, don't mix the two up. For the right. majority of staging systems now, it is AJCC, which is TNM, and it's superficial or deep to the fascia. Okay. And we, we spoke a little bit earlier about low versus high grade. So I don't, don't want to, or, or the continuum of, of grading. So I want to harp there too much you on go. that. <laughs> yeah. And, um, and we mentioned a, a little bit earlier, some of the, uh, some of the, some of the tumors that metastasize the lymph nodes. I'm just trying to see if we can remember here. We, we spoke about um, rhabdo. Uh, we spoke about uh, epithelioid, uh, synovial yep. sarcoma. Uh, yep. Hold on, help me out here. What else we got? <laughs> Angio and clear cell. Angio and clear cell. Yeah. You made more than I did, so you're doing pretty good. Uh, um, so, okay, just I guess just kind of just continuing in and, and moving on. Um, can you talk a little bit about, you know, so staging systems are different for soft tissue or bone sarcomas, or can you kind of kind of just expand on on that and, and how they're different and what, what makes them different? Yeah, so 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 they're different, um, largely because bone is by definition deep from the get go, right? Right. So 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 they're different, um, largely because of that, and they're also different because again, the differentiator between good and bad prognoses um, is the eight centimeter versus five centimeter. It's eight centimeter for bone. A B looks like an eight, it's five centimeter for soft tissue. And carcinoma and melanoma staging is, is, is above my pay grade. Those, those go to the melanoma clinic, the melanoma multidisciplinary clinic and um, the medical oncologist for the carcinoma. Yeah, perfect. And um, yeah, I don't, I don't, I have no idea the staging for those. Those are totally different. It's the same principles, but I'm not gonna have something recorded and somebody out there get a wrong question and all of a sudden they're knocking on my door get an email <laughs> i get an address yeah, yeah fire off emails to me saying yeah. i'm i'm terrible so. uh hold on did you have any anything you want to hit about about bone staging no i think you hit most of the high points um if anything uh we just possibly talk about you know treatment options resection versus viral resection versus um you know, reconstruction based on those stagings, but I'm not sure if that's a, it's going to be addressed later. Yeah, Dr. Porter, if you have a, a general, um, I know it's kind of, kind of hard to say exactly what treatment you do for what, but say, for example, we have, you know, a, a, a intracompartmental versus extra compartmental um, bone lesion. I guess what goes into your head as far as when you start trying to figure out how you would approach treating these? Um, does it, I assume, of course, it probably depends on the tumor, but is there any type of algorithm that you go through in your head? Yeah, that just depends on, um, that totally depends upon the, the tumor. Um, it depends upon where the tumor is. It depends upon the age of, uh, of the patient, it depends upon the comorbidities of the patient. It depends upon a lot. Um, what I can tell you is that um, what you have there for no TNM, um, we do use TNM for uh, for bone. Okay. Again, 
and um, the T and M for bone is going to be based on the A and B for bone is based on larger or smaller than eight centimeters. Just keep that the B looks like an eight, so larger or smaller than eight centimeters. Um, the intra versus extra compartmental is is the classic teaching of of Enneking, and I don't think that we uh, there's Enneking. I don't think that we would even be asking that on standardized exams, but don't quote me on that. Don't quote me on that. Yeah, hold on. I don't remember. I don't think they asked that last year. Have you seen Have you seen many questions on? Um, I know I've seen a couple on staging, but do you remember if it was any king or if it was or what it was? It's hard to say. I'm not sure what what the the classification was, but I do remember it was. Uh, it would definitely involve the the T the tumor stage and also like if we had met I'm not sure if it was which classification it was but I've seen one or two questions on that for sure. But you have to think about the fact that Enneking classification was created before the super duper imaging abilities that we have now, and so with the imaging modalities that they had then, um, intra versus extra makes total sense, right? It it just makes it makes sense. You can tell that pretty easily on on imaging studies that you had circa 1980 or I can't remember exactly when that staging system came out, but but um, nowadays people use the TNM system by and large, by and large. There are others out there, but by and large, and that's soft tissue, right? Right. That's soft tissue. Oh, and, we also and that's have... what I'm saying. If you look at that stage four, METS, stage one, low, any tumor size, stage three, is a 2B, deep and larger than five. Perfect, okay. And then this is right. a, that bone And then stage. that's the AJCC for the bone, exactly, right? This one, like I said before, bone is deep. So there really isn't the deep thing that you, um, the deep thing that you have for soft tissues. Your thigh, your femur is deep. Like if something's in your femur, by definition, it's deep. So if you remember this one being the same thing for low versus high, stage one is low, low grade, low grade, low grade, stage one, unless there's a met, low grade, low grade, low grade, stage one. The difference now between two and three is a three is a skip lesion. Remember we talked about that for osteosarc. Right. And then if it's not a skip lesion and if it's not low grade, and if you have no mets, you got a stage two. It has to be two. I, I like that. There's nothing else it can be. You got a stage two. And then you just got to figure out A versus B. And an eight looks like a B. Eight if it's greater like than eight, a it's a two B. That makes sense. So just to review that, and, and I, I may get it wrong here, but just to review what you just said, um, stage four, METS. You know, if you have METS, yep. it's stage four. If it's a low yep. grade, stage one. That's it. Then... If it's a skip lesion, stage three. And yep. if it's anything else, must be a stage two. And to, yep. on stage two, you're between A and B. B looks like an eight. If it's larger than eight centimeters, it's two B. There you go. All right, perfect. And I guess one more thing to kind of cover before we wrap up here is uh, benign bone lesions. I, I, I specifically remember a question about this because there's a way that there wasn't normal uh, Roman numerals versus you know just normal normal numbers. But can you can you quickly test base on um, benign bone staging for you know benign bone? Tumor? Oh man, I haven't staged anything benign in years. <laughs> um, Roman oh. numeral is is reserved for malignant. Arabic numerals are reserved for benign. Uh, oh yeah, there you go. So um, it's reserved for benign. And um, it's another thing that exists on a continuum and um, it's your standard orthopedic staging, right? For everything in orthopedics, stage one or grade one or a Russell Taylor one or whatever a one is, is near normal. In orthopedics, whatever a three is, is bad. And a two is in the middle. Like it, it, it is so, <laughs> it is so classic for ortho. It <laughs> right. is so classic for ortho. The difference is for this one though, there is some um, thought process in terms of, of what you do 
with these, right? So a stage three, I'm sorry, a grade three um, bone lesion or stage three bone lesion um, is much more amenable to resection and reconstruction. But you base that on the radiographic findings, you base it on the clinical findings, you base it on the patient characteristics. You don't base that on the staging system, which is why I never stage things with benign bone. And and just for an example, with something like a giant, like a locally aggressive giant cell tumor, would that be something that is that would... the classic example? Okay. Yeah, that is okay. the classic example. Proximal tibia giant cell tumor, distal radius giant cell tumor. Those are the classic examples. Well, uh, Dr. Porter, I think this was a great overview and definitely introduction to grading and staging. I'm hoping anybody listening to this, if they're going to take a an exam test that they will not get a question uh, wrong as far as staging and, and as far as um, you know, differentiating between low grade and yeah. high grades. Um, is there, before we wrap up, is there anything else that you want listeners to kind of get um, after listening to this podcast from any, any parting words that you want um, people to make sure that people understand and get? Absolutely. I would say that um, what I have just said should hopefully demystify this and will allow you to now read the staging chapter in whatever book you choose to read when you do your, your, your tumor rotation. And hopefully it'll make sense. Hopefully it'll make sense. We're trying to do two different things. We're trying to look at the tumor cells and tell us a little bit about the tumor cells. And we're trying to look at the body and tell ourselves a little bit about the burden. That's all grading and staging is. Perfect. And um, Dr. Porter, before we wrap up, we at the end of our shows, we always like to give our um, our listeners a way to reach out to you, whether it's Twitter. I know you gave your email a little bit earlier. If you want to repeat that, that's fine. Um, just so they can follow you. And, and, you know, you can definitely, again, plug your website, plug your scrub site. Yeah, um, it's I don't, um, I don't have a Twitter outside of my scrub business. And so just cause scrubs dot com. That's it and uh, justcausescrubs.com and we have all of the handles for uh, justcausescrubs.com. So follow us on Twitter, follow us on uh, Facebook, uh, join our LinkedIn page. We, uh, we have it all and um, it's all for a great, fantastic cause. Well, Dr. Porto, we appreciate you coming on. Dr. Hoda, we appreciate you coming on as a, uh, as, as a special guest on this episode and we appreciate your presence. Um, everybody listening, please again, hit that subscribe button and please go and leave a review in iTunes and we will see you again next week.